Well, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be back here at QIP. So today I'd like to show you some work uh, done together with uh, David Sutter, uh, which um, makes a connection between a problem with some concrete like applications for near-term quantum computing um, with some uh, quantities uh, from the resource theory of entanglement. So the title is circuit knitting with classical communication. So let me maybe start off by explaining what circuit knitting is. So uh, imagine you're an experimentalist and you have a large quantum circuit you'd like to run on your quantum computer, but your quantum circuit is too large, right? Maybe your quantum circuit has 200 qubits, but your quantum computer only has 100 qubits, right? So a priori, you just cannot run your, your circuit on your computer. Uh, so the idea of circuit knitting techniques is that you want to kind of uh, split up your circuit into smaller subparts, into smaller sub-circuits that individually fit on your quantum computer, right? And then you, you run these smaller sub-circuits and somehow you want to reconstruct the, the outcome of the original circuit uh, only from the outcomes of these smaller sub-circuits. And uh, obviously this is not something you can do efficiently, right? I mean, as well as it would imply that you could simulate an arbitrary large quantum computer with classical computers. So there must be some... Um, oh, my formulas are not showing. Ooh, I hope. There's supposed to be a formula here. So, okay, I hope it will be better in the next slide. So. Um, uh, essentially, you, you, you get a, a sampling overhead which is exponential in the number of cuts that you do. So the number of cuts, it would be like these two qubit gates that you kind of separate into uh, individual uh, local parts, right? And um, so the, the one, th one way you could think about this is it's kind of similar to like when people simulate near Clifford circuits on a classical computer uh, where you get like a, an exponential overhead in the number of non-Clifford gates. So obviously like the reason why um, why experimentalists are, are uh, interested in these sort of techniques is that well um, hopefully you know like it can uh, in, in, in the near term especially when in the early days of error correction we'll have so, many, so few like logical qubits that this could like kind of like just push the boundaries of what you can do with your quantum computer to facilitate you to do something useful with it a little bit earlier. So, okay, so we cannot get rid of this exponential overhead, uh, but what we can try to do is we can make the, the basis of the exponential overhead as small as possible. And the question essentially that we ask ourselves is now, if you allow for some sort of like uh, classical communication between our subsystems A and B, um, does this in any way allow us to, to reduce the basis of the exponential overhead? So uh, for that purpose, we first, I, I've, to, to put that a bit on a, on a more mathematical foundation, I have to explain to you, uh, well, first how we will, how we're going to do the, the, the circuit knitting. So for that, I need to explain to you uh, the concept of, of the quasi-probability simulation. So this is a framework that's not only used for circuit knitting, it also has other applications, but we're going to use it for circuit knitting today. And essentially the idea is that uh, we want to simulate a quantum computer that's a bit more powerful than the one that we have available. And uh, we only pay with additional shots of the circuits that we run, right? And this is very favorable for, for near-term applications because we're much more willing to pay with classical resources than with additional quantum resources. And um, so how are we going to do that? So, oh my god, uh, the slides... Are to get it off the computer and convert it to PDF on some other one? Yes, maybe. Uh, this is... It's a USB drive. Can you get it off the computer? Uh, All right. Well, no, it's, there's still a lot missing. Uh, can, you, can you save it on the thumb drive and you can try to convert it? Yeah. yeah uh, where is it? it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if not, maybe you can continue and use the blackboard. We try to convert your talk to PDF. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, I can maybe try to explain it in words. So, uh, I imagine that you, you have a, a computer with some sort of like uh, uh, non-universal instruction set. So I'm going to call this uh, instruction set S. And that instruction set S might contain uh, certain operations that your uh, quantum... Uh, computer can actually run, right? So imagine that here in this quantum circuit, in these boxes, I had like some of these operations F <laughs> in there, right? And so that the only uh, quantum circuits I can, I can run on my computer are these quantum circuits which have these operations F uh, in them. 
you can think of them like super operators, channels, or gates, or whatever. Uh, yeah. Okay. This. We now imagine that in your circuit you have like one single instruction uh, that lies uh, outside of that instruction set S. So uh, we want to sim still reconstruct the output of my circuit uh, if one of the uh, one of the gates or one of the instructions is not in my instruction set. And the way how we do that with quasi-probability simulation is that we have to to find a quasi-probabilistic decomposition of my non-supported instruction, which I'm going to call E here. So like one of these boxes was supposed to show E. I, wa I want to call that probabilistically decompose that into the uh, instructions that my computer can actually execute. So this means I want to find such a, a decomposition uh, with, with some coefficients which are real numbers and we call this a quasi-probability decomposition because some of these numbers uh, will typically be negative. Right, and uh, the, the whole joke of this quasi-probability, well, how much do I have? Not much. Okay. Um, okay. There's literally nothing left. So the the joke of this quasi probability simulation is that if you do it, the the you you have, you pay with some additional shots, and the number of shots that you pay is given uh, by the one norm of your quasi probability coefficients squared. Right. So essentially, uh, if you want to do this quasi-probability simulation, we don't, it's not important that we know how the details work. Essentially, you need to find such a quasi-probability de decomposition of the kind of non-supported operator into the uh, operators you can run a recording computer, and you want to find one with the smallest possible one norm of your coefficients. Can we try it with? Okay. Right. So this is this is uh, where we're standing. Right. I have this um, operation inside of my ins uh, outside my instruction set in my circuit, and I decompose it into some operations in my instruction set, and the a sampling overhead that I have to pay to do the simulation scales with the square of the one norm of this uh, decomposition. So maybe one last technical remark about this um, quasi-probability simulation. So uh, if you have multiple instances of, of these non-supported instructions in your circuit, right, uh, the easiest way how to simulate the whole circuit is essentially you want to apply this, this uh, kind of approach to every gate individually. So you find a quasi-probability decomposition for each of them, and then the overhead scales kind of um, multiplicatively, right? So the, essentially you can think of like the individual quasi-probability decompositions combining as a big, de big decomposition of the whole circuit, and you can quickly convince yourself that it's uh, multiplicative like that. And we'll see actually later on in my talk, uh, sometimes you can actually be a little bit smarter than doing the simulation individually, um, but I'm getting a bit ahead of, of my, uh, myself. Okay, so if, if uh, in the special case that our circuit contains n times uh, the one identical gate that we want to simulate, this essentially means that a sampling overhead is like n exponential in this number of like gates outside my instruction set, which is essentially where this exponential uh, cost of this quasi-probability simulation comes from. So you see that like this one norm really determines the basis of the exponential cost. Um, okay, so I was talking now very, very abstractly about this idea of quasi-probability uh, simulation, and um, this quasi -prob the, the reason for that is that I'd like to highlight that like different uh, techniques and areas kind of reuse the same ideas, but for, for different applications. So, for instance, people in error mitigation sometimes use this, this quasi-probability simulation to simulate uh, uh, an ideal noise-free gate by only having access to the noisy operations S, uh, of your quantum hardware. So these could be uh, like noisy gates, noisy measurements, and uh, combinations thereof. People sometimes also use it to simulate uh, near Clifford circuits. So you can try to, to for example, find a quasi-probability decomposition of some non-Clifford gate, for instance, a, a T gate into Clifford gates, and then simulate uh, a, um, a near Clifford circuit with a sampling overhead that's exponential in the number of non-Clifford gates. And the application that we care about today is circuit knitting. So we'll find, we we'll want to find some quasi-probability decomposition of some non-local gates. So some gate that uh, acts, no, uh, some channel essentially that acts non-locally across two parties, and we want to decompose it into essentially elements of either LO or LOCC, depending on whether we allow classical communication between our two parties A and B. Right. Um, so with that in mind, we, know, we already have enough to to kind of uh, um, formulate uh, the first important. 
uh, optimization problem in, 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 in this work. Right, so I was telling you we need to find this quasi probability decomposition of our non local gate into some sort of local operations, and we better find one that has the lowest possible one norm of, of quasi probability coefficients, right? And so the lowest possible one norm we can achieve, we call that uh, this, this gamma factor here. So for S, the instruction set either being LO or LOCC, I de define the gamma factor of some uh, non-local channel U, which we'll typically choose as a non-local gate, uh, as essentially the smallest one norm of quasi-probability coefficients, uh, optimizing over all these uh, possible um, quasi-probability decompositions, right? And obviously, you will, uh, when you think a little bit about it, the gamma factor over LOCC must be smaller or equal than the one over LO, clearly because, uh, well, LOCC is strictly more powerful than LO, right? But the question is now, is this, is this a strict inequality? Can we find a separation between LO and LOCC for the, this purpose of, of simulating uh, our non-local gate? And uh, well, as it turns out, the priority this is this is a quite a difficult optimization problem because uh, it's it's not convex. Uh, in principle, we might have an unbounded number of, of variables uh, that are part of this optimization problem. And if we're working, especially in the in the in this, uh, set S equals LOCC, we have to optimize our LOCC protocols, which well is notoriously difficult. So the way how we can still try to uh, say something sensible about this type of optimization problem is uh, we need to find a simpler instance of the problem and uh, then we try to relate uh, the, the general case to the simpler instance. So what's going to be the simpler instance that we consider? Uh, well, instead of trying to um, quasi-probabilistically simulate a, a, a non-local channel, let's try to simulate a non-local state instead, right? So I have some bipartite state uh, row AB, and uh, I define the gamma factor for this bipartite state row AB under LO or LOCC to be essentially the smallest gamma factor over all uh, super operators E that uh, prepare that uh, bipartite state out of uh, initial product state. Okay, so I just told you I want to find a simpler instance of the problem. Uh, now I've just concatenated two optimization problems together, right? Um, well, it turns out now that we're working on the level of, of states and not of channels, um, things do actually get easier thanks to, to this lemma here, uh, which tells us that gamma of LO equals gamma LO of CC equals some much easier optimization problem than the one we had before. So le let me kind of unpack uh, what this lemma is really telling us. So first of all, the fact that gamma LO and gamma LOCC for any bipartite state is the same tells us that essentially the quasi-probabilistic simulation of the preparation of, of, a, of a state does not in any way uh, um, take advantage of classical communication. So there's no separation between the two, which is already kind of an interesting result on its own. And furthermore, uh, on the right-hand side here, we see this optimization problem essentially boils down to saying, well, we want to find a decomposition of rho into separable states uh, with the smallest possible uh, one norm, again, of, of, of the coefficients. And in fact, um, when, when you're familiar with the, with the literature of um, um, entanglement measures, uh, you might recognize that this is in fact very closely related to an entanglement measure called the, the robustness of entanglement, which was um, originally proposed by Vidal and, and, and Tarach in uh, 99. And it turns out that our gamma factor is nothing else than just like one plus two times this robustness of entanglement. Which means on one hand that uh, a lot of the properties that are known about this well-studied well entanglement measure translate to our gamma factor, right? Uh, but you can also kind of see it, see it the other way around. We're giving like a new operational interpretation of what this robustness of entanglement means, right? It's kind of a overhead for the optimal overhead for simulating this non-local state using the quasi-probability method. Okay, so now we have a pretty good grasp on, on the gamma factor for states. What can we again, what, how can we use that to say something about the gamma factor of channels? Um, well, I want to give you a little bit of a flavor how these kinds of arguments can go. I will not go into full detail, but let's consider uh, essentially the simplest example we can think about for, for a non-local quantum channel, and that's the C0 gate. I mean, the C0 gate is Clifford, so many things will be much easier than for, for other gates. And in fact, uh, well, it's, it's well known under LOCC, essentially a non-local C0 is kind of equally powerful as, as, as shared 
EBIT because you can um, an instance of one always allows you to realize the other, right? If you have a, 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 a out of a C not, you can you can generate uh, uh, an EBIT, and if you have uh, a pre-shared EBIT, you can use this gate teleportation protocol here on the right to generate a C not out of it. Which essentially means that if you have a quasi probability decomposition of one of the two, it gives you one for the other as well with the same uh, quasi probability coefficients, right? So assume that you have a decomposition, for instance, of your EBIT into some sort of, of product uh, states with some coefficients AI, then this directly gives you also decomposition for the C0 in terms of some uh, LOCC protocols with exactly the same quasi-probability coefficients AI. And, the, and, and the, the other way around works exactly the same. If you have a decomposition of your C0, you can generate a decomposition of an EBIT out of it, which essentially tells you that neither one of the gamma factors can be um, smaller than the other one, so they must be the same. So the gamma factor of a C0 is equal to the gamma factor of an EBIT, which is, uh, again, like 1 plus 2 times this robustness of entanglement, which, which just turns out to be 3. So this argument, um, well, it gets a bit more complicated. We cannot do the same argument for all gates, but we are still able to show that for a large class of two qubit unitaries, um, following relations hold. So first of all, um, I'm not saying in detail what large class here means, but it kind of includes all two qubit Clifford gates as well as all controlled rotation gates. So this is a, a lot of, of, of gates which are interesting for, for computation applications are part of this large class. We show for this large class that the gamma factor under LOCC and LO is the same. And in fact, it turns out to be one times Two, uh, one plus two times the robustness of entanglement of this choice state. So the choice state is essentially when I have a maximally entangled state on both uh, sides of my bipartite state and apply this gate U on, on one leg of each. And um, so what this theorem tells us is that since the two gamma factors are the same, classical communication doesn't uh, actually help in, in, in the quasi-probabilistic simulation. So there seems to be no advantage in, in using classical communication. So you might think, okay, well, that's the story of it. It's a negative result. Um, there's no point in using classical communication. But it turns out that actually this is not quite the end because mathematically what, what this statement is telling us, looking at the gamma factor, just tells us that when we have a circuit with a one single instance of that non-local gate U, then there's no advantage of using classical communication. And in fact, uh, so for the last few slides, I, I will show you that we found an explicit protocol, I mean, a LOCC protocol, which allows us to effectively reduce the sampling overhead in the setting where we have a, a, a circuit with multiple uh, instances of a gate U. And essentially, the idea is we have to treat these multiple instances of the gates jointly together instead of like applying the, the optimal strategy individually to each of them. Uh, so the, the, the main workhorse essentially for, for, for this idea is that we need to realize that uh, our, our entanglement measure, right, this gamma factor, is strictly sub-multiplicative under uh, the, the tensor product. So first of all, thanks to this relation to the robustness of entanglement, we, we can explicitly find a, a formula for this gamma factor of any uh, pure bipartite state in terms of its Schmidt coefficients. And as you can see, uh, the gamma factor for one EBIT is kind of three, and for two EBITs, it's seven, which is smaller than three times three, and this regularized uh, gamma factor of an EBIT actually turns out to be two. So the, the physical meaning of this is that if you want to um, simulate multiple EBITs, right, you want to simulate n EBITs, then it's better, it's cheaper to simulate them all at once optimally, instead of applying the, the like simulating a single uh, EBIT optimally and repeating that n times, right? So somehow the the global optimal strategy is um, strictly better than the local optimal strategy concatenated together. Um, so what does uh, that tell us for um, for our channels? Well, let's get back to the easiest example again, let, uh, the Synod gate. And imagine now that we have uh, uh, um, as a circuit that contains multiple instances of such non-local synod gates between our two parties. Well, what we can do, we can realize each of these synod gates uh, using a gate teleportation protocol, right? So we reduce the problem of simulating the synod gates to uh, simulating the EBITs. 
And what we do next is essentially exactly the same trick what people do when they uh, simulate magic in, in, in near Clifford circuit, right? They, they uh, realize the magic by some sort of, of uh, magic state injection gadget and uh, move all the magic to the very beginning of the circuit into like one big magic state at the beginning, right? And then the remaining uh, circuit is purely Clifford. Here we do exactly the same thing. We pull out all of the entanglement out of our circuit to the very beginning, such that the remaining circuit is purely LOCC. And now that we generate all this EBIT at once, right, at the same time, in the same time slice of our circuit, uh, we can make use of this strict submultiplicative property uh, of, of the gamma factor to simulate these EBITs more efficiently, right? Because simulating them at once is cheaper than like simulating uh, a single EBIT multiple times in a row. So this allows us to uh, effectively reduce uh, our gamma factor from for C0 from, from 3 to 2, essentially, which can make a big uh, difference in, in terms of asymptotics. Okay, so I think uh, time is very short, so I will not speak too much about the outlook and the other results. Maybe just a, a little uh, taste. Um, so we, we, I only talked about cutting gates in, in, in this presentation, like how, how you can um, separ like, uh, separate the, the, the circuit into two parts by doing a, 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 a horizontal cut. But actually, in, in many cases, it might be actually smarter to do also include like vertical cuts like that, so cutting wires. We, we distinguish that by calling like gate cuts and wire cuts. And as it turns out, you can ask similar questions about uh, classical communication um, playing a role for, for wire cuts. And in contrary to, to gate cutting, it turns out that for wire cuts, uh, there's actually a strict separation between classical communication, no classical communication, even, you, even if you do one single cut. So actually, we just put that on the archive two days ago, so that's a very fresh result. And right, and we also have some some thoughts about uh, using the submultiplicativity for uh, non-Clifford gates, but I think I will probably skip that for the interest of time. So uh, thank you for your attention, and I'd be very happy to answer your questions. Knitting under pressure and with wire cutters. Wow! All right. Thanks for the nice talk. So in the context of the Clifford plus T simulators, um, there is this kind of gamma one norm quantity. Mm -hmm. But the best, uh, you know, the, the algorithm that we have scales in a different quantity, which is a rank. And yes. Upper bounded by this gamma quantity. So I wonder if there's also a rank quantity in your context? That's a very good question. You're, you're right. So uh, in, in the context of, of near Clifford uh, circuits, these rank based simulators are usually significantly better than the robustness-based simulators, right? Usually you have a square root uh, speed up. So we, we thought about this, and it's not entirely clear how to make use of it, uh, mostly because we're, we're not doing classical simulation. We're actually like trying to combine quantum, like we want to do the individual uh, circuits quantumly on a true quantum computer. Um, so it's, we, we thought about it, and I, we didn't find anything obvious to do, yeah. But this is a very, very good question, yeah. Thanks for the... Is it on? Yeah. Uh, th thank you. Um, so do you think you can apply similar ideas to define an operationally meaningful measure for multipartite entanglement? Yes. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure you, you, you can do the same thing. Uh, you're, you're essentially going to end up with the like multipartite uh, variant of the robustness of entanglement, yeah. Pretty sure that should translate one to one. Um, in, in practice, I'm not sure like how practically relevant that is. The, I mean, you usually don't have like three qubit gates in, in, I mean, usually you decompose it into like two qubit gates plus one qubit gates, right? So for the application of circulating, it's maybe not clear, but I'm pretty sure you can, you can translate it to the multipartite setting. Maybe it's useful in a quantum internet setting, like what state? Network. <laughs> maybe that will work. Yeah, no, that that's a good good point. Uh, yeah, maybe there are applications. We we haven't really looked too much into it. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you for the nice talk. Um, so, if I understand correctly, you're decomposing EPR pairs into separable states in order to achieve um, this like simulated gate teleportation that you're doing. Correct. Do you know if it's uh, Do you know if it's easy to 
implement those separable states or like to prepare them easily with polynomial size circuits and without in silica qubits? Huh. Good question. Um, no, I, I don't, we haven't looked at that. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, in your set of uh, operations that you're decomposing onto, mm -hmm. uh, do you have post-selection operations? Yes, yes. So we, we allow for uh, trace non-increasing operations, which you essentially you simulate with post-selection, yes. So when you're like uh, combining the post-selected output of one part of stuff to another patch of your original circuit that you're trying to do, um, don't you also have this like additional, I don't know, shot overhead that you need to take into account in order to actually implement this? Yes, so um, this is, I mean, this, this is captured in the fact that we model post-selection with trace non-increasing maps, right? So the, 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 the fact that the trace is decreasing kind of captures the fact that some of the shots are just going to get effectively thrown away. Okay, very last, very short question. Thanks for a nice talk. So I think that if you want to like simulate the thing, then uh, the Alice and Bob have to apply the correlated uh, operations uh, when, when it comes to like a probabilistic uh, error cancellation type of thing. Yes. You consider the, the local operations, uh, but I think if you want to do that, then you also need the shared randomness between these two parties. So it, it, is your LO actually like including the shared randomness or? Yes, so th th that's a very good point. I, I kind of glossed over that in the presentation. Essentially, when we're saying we allow for classical communication, we really mean classical communication during the circuit execution. We allow for shared randomness before the cir circuit starts executing, and like also, there's also communication at the end when you combine the results together. But the, the important part here is, for instance, you, you, you could imagine that if you cut your circuit into two parts, you could, for example, run the, especially if you don't have classical communication between them, you can run them you don't have to run them at the same time. You can run them sequentially on on on, a, on on the same quantum computer. So yes, the classical communication is really about classical communication during the ex circuit execution, not before and after. Okay, so I think we should uh, thank the speakers, thank all the speakers, and. The